that I mean uh, Matt Coons and Elliot Quadert have finished both of their lectures on introductory plasma astrophysics. Uh, you've had a number of lectures on relativistic MHD and numerical methods. Um, and we're uh, current on lectures by uh, a variety of people on MHD methods. Um, uh, oh, yes, we also learned that the uh, next president of the United States is going to be a woman last night, so that's interesting too and exciting. Um, so what's happened? Um, so given all of that, I didn't really want to um, talk about MHD methods again. I want to talk about something completely different, namely methods for radiation magnetohydrodynamics. So the, the, the problem with that, however, is that this is also a huge subject. Um, uh, hopefully you've had a course in stellar atmospheres and rate of transfer, and so you know some of the basics. Uh, if not, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover this topic and give it justice uh, in, one, in one hour or one and a half hours. And so the problem is I'm going to have to give a somewhat superficial and overview of the topic. But the reason why I wanted to do this is because I feel like methods for MHD are actually quite mature. Uh, there's a lot of public codes you can download that do MHD quite well. Moreover, our understanding of the physics of MHD is progressing rapidly, and there's a lot of very interesting applications that are underway. And I think that's very different in the case of radiation MHD, however. There, the numerical methods are very much under development. In fact, there's controversy about even the most basic things, like what the right formulation of the equations you should be solving. And moreover, there are no public codes, really, and um, they use very different methods, the codes that do exist, and we're still trying to understand which methods are the most attractive. And then finally, I believe that there's an awful lot of interesting physics that we're going to learn as we begin to add radiation into astrophysical fluid dynamics. So I believe it's a very hot topic for the next 10 years or more. And in the spirit of giving you know, uh, students an insight into what might be hot topics, I felt I wanted to talk about this topic, radiation MHD. So those are the pros and cons. Let me just summarize what I'm going to be talking about here today. I'm going to give you a brief introduction about what I mean by radiation hydrodynamics. I'll talk about some methods for it based on diffusion approximation and full transport methods. These are methods that I've used. So this is a very subjective review. I'm mostly going to talk about things that I tried myself, and I'll mention what other people are also doing, although I won't review that in nearly in depth. Uh, I'll talk about how to you know, include these techniques in the Godunov schemes, like uh, uh, most MHD codes in astrophysics. Uh, and finally, uh, if I have time at the end, I will take a little bit to say about uh, this new version of Athena and how it plugs into my previous two lectures. It gives me a chance to talk about issues like adaptive mesh refinement, curvilinear meshes, scaling, and so forth. Okay, so let me begin by motivating. Why radiation hydro? So let's take a specific application area where you might be interested in uh, doing applications. Black hole accretion flows. We like to understand the structure and dynamics of accreting plasma onto both supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies, powering quasars and AGN, or stellar mass black holes in close binary systems powering things like X-ray binaries. So what would we need to study these systems? Well, as Charles gave us a great introduction uh, already, what we need for sure is MHD, because we know f uh, that angular momentum transport is what controls the accretion of plasma in these systems, and angular momentum transport itself is controlled by MHD turbulence produced by this linear instability in, in Keplerian rotating flows, the so-called MRI, the magnetorotational instability. So if we want to study ab initio accretion onto black holes, we're going to need to make sure that we're at least doing MHD. And there's a lot of work, Charles summarized a little bit, on simulations of the properties of the MRI in various uh, approximations, various domains, and so on. But in addition, if you're talking about accretion uh, onto luminous sources, you also need to worry about radiation. And that's because since the Seminoles paper 40 years ago, we've understood that radiation pressure is very important. Not only important, it dominates. So the highest energy density is not in the thermal gas pressure, but in the radiation pressure inside a couple of 100 RG around a black hole accreting close to the Eddington luminosity. Uh, and even, even if you're accreting a tenth of Eddington or... Uh, a fraction of that, you're still going to be radiation dominated in the inner regions of the accretion flow. And so radiation is at least as important probably as, as magnetic fields in the inner parts of the flow. And so we need to include that. Why hasn't it been included up to now? Because it's incredibly difficult to solve the radiation hydro equation. So we've known it's been important. It's just that adding it in self-consistently is very, very difficult. So again, this is only for 
accretion onto luminous sources. If you're talking about Sag A star or very um, low luminosity AGN, then it's a very different regime. The radiation is not so important. And we've heard some uh, talks and we'll hear some more about how to model that reg regime of accretion. And it's not merely a theoretical question about, well, what happens if we add radiation? There's sort of predictions about what happens in radiation disks, making this alpha onsatz that Charles mentioned, namely if you assume that the shear stress is just proportional to the total pressure through some constant, dimensional constant alpha, then we know that these disks would be viscously unstable. That is to say, they would bunch up into rings during accretion. They'd also be thermally unstable. They would either heat up and run away or cool down and collapse. But of course, we know that the shear stress is not just alpha P, it's given by MHD turbulence, it's driven by the MRI, and so we'd like to understand whether these instabilities exist with the MRI or not. So that's the motivation. Just in that one application domain alone, it's very clear that radiation is very, very important. So how are we gonna do this? So Foundations of Radiation Hydrodynamics, the title of a very important book that, I, that everyone should get if you're interested in working in this domain uh, by Mahalis and Mahalis, it really is uh, sort of the Bible of the field. It, it's a very, very comprehensive book that not only covers gas dynamics, deriving Navier-Stokes equations from kinetic theory, but also rate of transfer in cell atmospheres and radiation hydrodynamics. There's also an important book by John Castor, uh, not quite so comprehensive, but a little more uh, modern and a little bit more about numerical methods for radiation hydrodynamics. I recommend both of these books. So why, why is radiation hydrodynamics hard? Because, uh, which equations to solve? Do we solve the rate of transfer equation directly or do we solve its moments? That's exactly analogous to asking, do we solve the collisionist Boltzmann equation for ions and uh, uh, electrons or do we solve the fluid equations, the moments of that Boltzmann equation to, to evolve the fluid variables? Uh, it's exactly analogous, but unlike the plasma case where there's a clear cut answer to that question based on the collisionality of the plasma, there's no clear cut answer to that question in radiation hydro because generally the, the photon mean free path varies enormously in, in almost every case you can imagine. Which frame should you solve the equations in? Should you solve them in the Lagrangian co-moving frame of the fluid? That makes the scattering and material interaction terms really easy. Or should you solve them in the Eulerian, the grid frame, which is where you're solving the fluid equations? Or you should, should you try to use some mixed frame in between? Uh, people make different choices here. Uh, if you're gonna use the uh, moment equations, how do you close those moment equations? And I'll talk a lot about that. Moreover, just as a mathematical problem, it's challenging because the form of these partial differential equations, the moment equations, changes depending on the regime you're in. They're either hyperbolic in the streaming limit or they're mixed hyperbolic parabolic in the diffusion limit. And so your numerical method, uh, you know, numerical methods that are strictly built for solving strictly hyperbolic problems are not necessarily going to map very well uh, for the diffusion regimes. There's a very wide range of time scales in the problem, varying from the light crossing time all the way down to flow times, advection times. And since the light crossing time can be enormously shorter than flow times, you may need implicit methods to get rid of light crossing times if they're not important in your problem. The dimensionality of the problem is enormous and adding frequency dependence just makes it, makes it worse. And so most people right now are working on gray or frequency integrated problems. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, if you really want to model material radiation interaction uh, accurately and directly, you may need to include non-LTE effects. You may need to include level population, setting the opacity in, in the uh, various ions and, and uh, atomic species that are present in the flow. And that, al that alone is also extremely co complicated. Doing the level population calculations in concert with their transfer and the dynamics is going to be very, very expensive. And so basically no one's trying to do this right now, at least very, very limited people are. Frequency dependence also remains an area for the future. We're still arguing about how to solve the frequency integrated equations uh, sort of accurately and efficiently. So hopefully you get a sense of why there's so much here to do yet. And another issue about radiation hydro is that it actually means different things to different people. You can be talking to your colleague and they can tell you that they're doing a radiation hydro problem, but that isn't sufficient to tell you exactly what they're doing because there's such a wide range of things that people call radiation hydro. And let me give you an example or a few examples. In some cases, people mean radiation hydro only to include the energy transport terms very via the material radiation interaction terms. So they're basically solving the equations of 
hydrodynamics with an energy equation that has a source term in it where the source term is coming from the radiation material interaction. I've written it here in a form following notation due to Castor, uh, the zeroth component of a four vector where the zeroth component integral over, over frequencies, integral over solid angles of the net emission coefficient J and the scattering term kappa K. So basically, the net heating cooling rate due to emission and absorption and the scattering. If you have Compton scattering, for example, this would change the energy of the flow. So basically, all you're doing is including this local interaction term into the hydro equations. So you might have, this could be modeled as optically thin cooling in interstellar medium, H2 regions, and so on. Even in this regime, however, if you're doing non-LT problems, this, this source term could be quite complex to, to calculate. So that's one regime of radiation hydro. People say they're doing hydro with optically thin cooling, and some people call that radiation hydrodynamics. This is a, a chance to do a very quick aside on how you would do that in a Godinus scheme. These are the slides, some of the slides I missed at the end of my last lecture. Uh, you know, aside of adding these source terms into the equations, it's really very, very straightforward. Uh, if you're using something called operator splitting, which is a, a common technique, there's basically two ways to go. Either you embed the source terms directly into the multi-step integration, time integration procedure. Uh, for example, using Runge-Kata methods, you would include the source term directly in every sub-step, or you could just split it off completely. The latter uh, is only first order accurate in time, but is quite a lot easier to implement and is often used. Um, and so th that's your sort of two approaches in terms of adding it to the to the uh, time integration technique. So here's an example of, here's an energy equation written with a radiation interaction term on the right-hand side, a cooling term where lambda is some per particle cooling rate, say for the ISM, and H is some per particle heating rate, say due to uh, heating by stellar photons. So this is a very, very typical form of the cooling terms, heating terms for an ISM simulation. Uh, and I talk about using implicit differencing here I wanted to show this simply because while this is straightforward to implement numerically, uh, it changes the physics very, very substantially in a way that back reacts on the numerics. And if you just simply add this term without really understanding what it does, it can get you into trouble. This is my warning. It's easy to add this term using the recipes I've described here, but it makes this physics much more complex. For example, in the interstellar medium, typical cooling curve introduces thermal instability. It introduces two phases, uh, a cool, dense phase and a hot, rarefied phase that can be coexist at the same pressure. Um, and if you just add this term and try to model this cooling instability, it gets you into trouble. And the reason why is because the dispersion relation, the growth rate for the thermal instability, so that's the vertical axis here, plotted versus wavelength has this form. The solid line is the growth rate of the thermal instability without any heat conduction. And you notice that at the shortest wavelengths is the highest growth rate, which means at the grid scale, that's where the fastest growing modes of the cooling instability exist, which means that any truncation error on the grid scale is going to excite the thermal instability, cause it to grow rapidly at the grid scale and give you all kinds of grid scale structure that's not physical. It's all excited by truncation error. However, if you add con heat conduction, thermal conductivity, then you cut off the thermal instability at the shortest wavelengths. And so the different lines here are for different values of the conductivity. The points to show you that if you add thermal conduction plus cooling, you can use it to calibrate your numerical method by measuring the growth rates of the instability numerically. The, the importance of the thermal instability is it cuts off the, sorry, th the importance of thermal conduction is it cuts off the thermal instability at the grid scale. And that changes the nonlinear outcome of this very substantially. If you do a multidimensional hydrodynamical calculation of the thermal instability, just including cooling and no conduction, you get all this fragmentation at the grid scale into these tiny little fragments the size of the mesh. Whereas if you include conduction to cut it off, you get much more structured flow that's resolved. And it's likely this is not correct, and this is the actual structure of thermal stability. So it's sort of a warning that while you can add these terms in, you have to be careful. They change the physics, and you may need to add in other things as well to get an accurate solution. There's lots of paper in the literature that have been studying thermal instability without conduction, and, and uh, so it may have an impact on a lot of this. So just a warning. And, and another aside, another application domain where you can sort of think of it as just doing energy transport alone, you're only worrying about the energy transport properties of the photons, is studying ionization 
uh, and so ionizing radiation transport. So, for example, studying uh, formation of H2 regions in the interstellar medium or uh, feedback, reionization in the early universe. Uh, to solve that problem, you need to solve the MHD equations for both ions and neutrals. You need to include heating and cooling, and you also need to include photoization recombination. So now the system of equations are the MHD equations plus for the energy equation, there's these heating and cooling terms, much like I just wrote down for the ISM. And in addition, you need an ionization uh, balance equation, an equation for the neutral density that includes recombination and ionization terms. And while I don't write out all these terms in all their glory, they depend on the optical depth of ionizing photons from the source. So this IPH here is the critical uh, thing you need to compute. It's the uh, intensity of ionizing photons uh, summed from all the points N, all the sources of radiation N in the system. So it's basically the distance at any point in the flow to the positions of all these point sources times e to the minus tau, where tau is the optical depth from the point x where you are to, the, uh, to these point sources xn. And so the rate of transfer problem has reduced to calculating this integral here. Basically, you have to take path integrals from the positions of every point source to every grid point in your domain. And uh, that, that is a rate of transfer problem, but a very special one that can be implemented with very, very special techniques. And you may be familiar, there's uh, well-developed techniques using so-called adaptive ray tracing methods from uh, Abel and Wandelt uh, and Whelan and Norman. So they use this Helpix library to discretize the sphere and to create rays from every point source to every grid cell. Uh, and this is basically what most people use, I think, now. Um, and uh, you know, the tests of this method include you know, following the propagation of ionization fronts in uniform media. And there's quite a few papers that do this test and implement these algorithms. The challenge here is, is paralyzing this, uh, because if you're doing domain decomposition and you have some domains where there aren't any point sources, they essentially have nothing to do until the photons come from the other uh, domains where there are point sources. And so load balancing this is quite a challenge, and there's been quite a lot of recent work. Uh, perhaps Evo Stryker today will say more about this, uh, because I know she and her students have been working hard on trying to improve the performance of this, uh, these algorithms on uh, domain decomposition with MPI. So that's just another aside of an algorithm which I would say people call radiation hydrodynamics, but is in this regime where you're really only worrying about transfer of energy by photons. So that's one class of radiation hydro. Another class is where, forget about energy transfer, you're only worried about momentum transfer. So in that case, you, quote, only need to include the momentum of the photon. So you, again, solve the uh, fluid equations. You don't have an energy equation because you're assuming that the gas is isothermal. You're assuming the rate of transport and energy transport is so efficient that photons keep the gas isothermal. But you do need to compute the uh, three components of the four force on the, on the fluid. You need to compute the, the radiation force, the momentum exchange. Again, the same term, but just an n. Uh, uh, unit vector included in the integral. And a, an excellent example of this is line-driven winds in hot stars. Over the last 20 or 30 years, we've gained a an, an, uh, tremendous understanding of how hot stars, O and B stars, produce powerful winds through line driving, through strong resonant absorption lines, mostly in the UV. Uh, and so in those flows, incorporating an approximation for this term in order to compute the structure of those winds uh, is, is very important. And, and yet again, the physics becomes complicated. There, it changes the hydrodynamics, introduces new wave modes, so-called Abbott waves, which actually can be unstable in certain regimes. It generates shock waves, uh, instabilities in the outflowing winds. So again, an enormous literature studying this radiation hydrodynamics problem where you're only including momentum. And then finally, you may need to do the most general problem, including both energy and momentum exchange. So now you've got, again, the fluid equations, momentum, uh, sorry, momentum, mass conservation, energy, and then you also have moment equations for the radiation field, and uh, radiation energy density, a radiation flux, a radiation pressure tensor, and the, the source terms are equal and opposite in the fluid equations and in the radiation equations. So whatever heating or cooling occurs in the radiation field is the exact opposite in the fluid. And similarly, whatever momentum exchange there is in the radiation field is the exact opposite in the, in the fluid frame, where, again, these terms come from these integrals. 
So this is a more complicated problem where you have to solve the moment equations directly, include both energy and momentum transport. Examples include this modeling X-ray uh, binaries, modeling accretion flows, radiation-dominated accretion flows. Is this regime, you need both energy and momentum transport. Another example is core collapse supernova where you just replace photons with neutrinos and then you're doing neutrino transport on that problem. So this is also a radiation hydrodynamics problem and I would argue probably the most general radiation hydrodynamics problem. But my point is that very different methods are required in each regime. If you, if you wrote an algorithm to solve these full moment equations uh, in full generality, it wouldn't be wise to use this to study optically thin cooling in the interstellar medium because it's just sort of way too much overkill. Your method is way too complicated for the problem at hand. And so these are all different radiation hydro problems and you have to think about which one you're doing. So for the rest of the lecture, I'm really gonna be talking about this problem, studying the full generality, including radiation uh, moment equations of the transfer equation. So how do we do this? So the basic system of equations are the fluid equations plus the rate of transfer equation. It's the fundamental description of the radiation field the frequency dependent transfer equation, where I knew here is the specific intensity along every direction at every point and every frequency, uh, it gives you the full description of the radiation field. In fact, this equation can be thought of as, as a collisionless Boltzmann equation for the photons, and I is really the distribution function of the photons in an exactly anal analogous way to the distribution function F for particles in a plasma and solving the uh, Boltzmann equation for particles. And again, I mentioned that these terms can be very complicated to compute unless you make assumptions like local thermodynamic uh, equilibrium. So in LTE, the emissivity is just the Planck function. That makes it in a local function of temperature only and makes it much easier to compute. So there's two approaches, solving this equation directly or taking its moments uh, over phase space, over angles, over momentum space basically, to derive a set of moment equations and solve a set of fluid equations. Why would you want to do that, take moment equations? Because it greatly reduces the dimensionality of the problem, as we'll see. And even there, once we've decided, you know, once we have to make a choice about which way to go, solve the transfer equation, the moment equations, if you're solving the transfer equation, there's still more choices to be made. You could use either grid-based methods or you could use particles. Again, exactly analogous to the plasma problem where you could use PIC, particles or you could use grid-based methods, uh, finite uh, momentum space, grid-based methods for solving the Boltzmann equation. So the advantages of the grid is that it can be more accurate with less noise. Uh, the problems with it are that it's difficult to extend for lines for scattering and line transport, doing frequency-dependent transport, it can be very, very complicated. It can be very expensive because you're having to discretize the specific intensity of seven-dimensional phase space or, uh, uh, and so that's a very, very large phase space to be solving this equation. Or you can use particles, which would be the Monte Carlo approach. Uh, very flexible, easy to extend, including frequency dependent transport lines. It's embarrassing parallel, very easy to code. You can get a Monte Carlo code working very, very quickly. Uh, the only issue is that it can be noisy uh, and the noise can be the real issue. Uh, so here's an example of what, what the issue is here. So, what, what I'm gonna show you here is a comparison between a grid-based method and Monte Carlo method for a specific application. This is the calculation of a radiation-dominated accretion disk, as I was mentioning in the beginning. Here is the uh, uh, equatorial plane. This is the radial dimension, and this is the vertical height above the midplane. So here's the midplane of the disk. Uh, well, actually, it's a bit above the midplane, but it's, it's sort of uh, radial coordinate towards the midplane here. So you can see the density field here. So it's very, very turbulent. There is a, a very strong density gradient with height in this, in this disk. And then what, our, what I'm showing you is the Z component of the Eddington factor, which is the ratio of the ZC component of the radiation pressure tensor divided by the radiation energy density. And so I'm showing you this quantity FZ computed using a technique called flux limit diffusion, which I'll describe in a minute using something called uh, short characteristics, a grid-based method to solve the transfer equation directly, using either 24 angles or 168 angles, and also using Monte Carlo, using uh, 10 million photons. Just to take a snapshot of this flow, no dynamics, just take a snapshot, solve the transfer equation, compute the Eddington factor, compare them. What you see 
is that the grid-based method in Monte Carlo agree extremely well. That's good. They're both getting the same answer to the transfer equation. But you can also see that even with 10 to the 7 photons, there's still a lot of noise, uh, especially down in the, in the lower region. This is noise at the level of, of a percent or so. And if you're doing radiation hydrodynamics and you're getting 1% fluctuations in the pressure uh, because of the noise in Monte Carlo, that's going to generate a tremendous number of sound waves. It's going to interact with the turbulence. You probably want to beat that noise down more. Um, and so it's not so much that Monte Carlo uh, isn't giving you an accurate answer for I, it's that we're taking these moments, right? We're taking the second moment of I, dividing by the zeroth moment, and we're demanding, and we're looking for slight asymmetries in these moments, and we're requiring that those be accurate to fractions of a percent. And that's where it's very, very challenging to beat down the noise in these radiation pressure-dominated regimes. If you're not doing a radiation pressure-dominated regime, this noise wouldn't probably matter because there's really no coupling from the radiation pressure on it, and so it might be, might be much better. So, uh, so this is what I mean by the noise can matter in an application, for example, radiation pressure-dominated disks. So by the way, this Monte Carlo method was also a lot more expensive. It probably could be greatly improved. We're probably not using the best optimized method, but nonetheless, it's going to be extremely expensive to do this compared to grid-based methods. And let me just point out that the, uh, you know, which one of these pictures doesn't look like the other? I can't sing it like they do on Sesame Street, but, uh, you know, that one is just in left field. It doesn't look anything like the other ones. In fact, what it looks like is the density field. Uh, you can see that all the features that are in the flux and diffusion Eddington tensor are all actually replicated in the density field, and they're not like what's going on down here. This is a warning sign that FLD isn't really giving you the appropriate Eddington tensor. It's not really giving you the right answer for this pressure tensor in this regime uh, for reasons that I'll explain in a while. Now, having uh, dumped on Monte Carlo, let me say it's really great, actually, especially for general relativistic problems where, you know, following photons along geodesics is complicated. Here's these beautiful images from uh, Josh Dolenz and Charles Gammy of what the flow in Sagittarius A star might look like if we ever had an uh, event horizon telescope with enough resolution to really see this at 1.3 millimeters. These are different inclinations of the disk. No noise there. It looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, and so Monte Carlo, when applied to problems where you're not radiation pressure dominated, can look beautiful. Moreover, you know, we're making images here, so you can cover the image plane with as many particles as you want. You know, we're not sampling every three-dimensional point in space to compute an Eddington tensor like you need to do for radiation hydro. All we're doing is computing what the photon field looks like in the observer's frame in some particular direction. And so you need way, 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 way fewer packets to do that and get a, a beautiful image. So Monte Carlo certainly has its place. It's certainly an attractive area for all kinds of problems. And this is what I'm saying. We don't really know for all problems which the best way to go is. I'm going to describe for you uh, one kind of problem or one kind of approach, uh, grid-based methods. So let me turn to the moment equations and how you would solve these uh, on, a, on a computer. So let, I'll uh, you know, one approach is solving the transfer equation using discrete angles directly. I'm not going to describe that in detail. It's certainly an attractive way to go. Its only downside is its expense, and I'll return to that at the very, very end. But an even more attractive way to go is to use these moment equations because it greatly reduces the dimensionality of the problem and makes the problem much cheaper. So I'm going to focus mostly on using, solving methods that use the moment equations. So here they are written out again. Uh, hydro terms in black, the MHD terms in blue, the radiation terms now, including the source terms, written in red. This is the system of equations we have to solve. E is radiation energy density, F the flux, P the pressure. These source terms can either be calculated in uh, the fluid frame or the, or the Eulerian frame or some mixed frame. Uh, mixed frame, I think, has emerged to be the most popular because they're, uh, that is to say, you calculate the source term in the fluid frame, but you calculate all the other radiation quantities and fluid quantities in the lab frame and you transform back and forth between the two in order to calculate these source terms. You can either do these transforms analytically using order V over C expansions and get analytic forms for the terms, or you can just do simply Lorentz boost this, the, uh, the quantities at every time step to compute the source terms and, uh, and then Lorentz boost them back into the lab frame to add the source terms to the, to the fluid. Either way works just fine. Um, so, the issue in solving these equations comes down to a closure. 
So we know from the Hydra equations that it involves a, a higher moment of the particle distribution function P, but we have an equation of state that relates this second moment of the distribution function to lower, mom lower order moments. P is a function of density and temperature, and so we know how to close these equations. We don't know what that is for radiation. In the same way, we have a second moment here, the radiation pressure tensor, uh, and, but we don't know how this tensor is related to the energy density in flux. We cannot assume that the distribution function is Maxwellian due to frequent collisions and therefore write down an analytic closure for the, uh, or an analytic equation of state. We don't know what that should, should be because in general, photon collisions don't make the, you know, don't exist and they don't make the distribution function Maxwellian for sure. So the critical issue is what is this closure? Uh, how do we relate the pressure tensor to, say, the zeroth moment, the energy density? We can just arbitrarily write it in terms of some unknown tensor F here. We can just simply define the ratio of pressure to energy density to be a tensor F. We call this tensor the variable Eddington tensor. And so our challenge is to calculate F, the ratio of P to E. And there's various ways to do this. Some people, uh, or one approach, is to use something called flux limit diffusion. That is to say, let's just assume that the flux is given by Fick's law, just the gradient of the energy density. I don't need this anymore because I know what the flux is directly. Uh, where lambda here is some limiter that prevents superluminal transport in optically thin regimes. If I just applied Fick's law directly in optically thin regions, I would find a flux that exceeds C times E. That would be violate causality. I'd be transporting energy faster then at the speed of light, uh, then photons are limited to the speed of light, so that would, that would violate this condition. So this limiter is just a factor that has the right limits in the optically thin and optically thick regions to give us the right solution. So this is one approach. A second approach is to do a little better. Let's not throw away uh, the flux equations. Let's not assume the flux is just a closed form of, of uh, cl you know, let's not assume a closed form for the flux in terms of energy density. Let's actually calculate the flux using an Eddington tensor that has a specific form. Let's just make an assumption about what this Eddington tensor is, but still keep the, uh, all the radiation moment equations. And the assumption that one makes is, is sort of written out here in all its glory. The underlying assumption is that there is some frame of reference in which the radiation field is isotropic, and I just need to calculate the, trans, the, uh, the transform between that frame and, and the frame of the, of the flow, and that will give me what the Eddington tensor is in, in my lab frame, and then I can apply that. So all I'm doing is making an assumption about the isotropy of the radiation field in some frame. Given that assumption, you can write down uh, what the Eddington tensor should be in terms of this factor C, so on here. And it has the right limits automatically. It goes to one in the streaming limit and it goes to a third in the uh, diffusion limit just like it should. They're all sort of built in automatically uh, into the form of the uh, equations that come from this. And that's called the M1 closure and it's proving to be very popular. Uh, finally, I could just compute this Eddington tensor directly. I can use uh, what we would, you know, we call this the VET method, but it's really just calculating F. You just make an assumption about the time dependence of the flow. Let's just assume the light crossing time is extremely fast. So this is valid for Newtonian flows, in which case I can just take snapshots of the flow at every time step and solve the time independent transfer equation. And so the transfer equation is only depending on path S. So here's my, my MHD grid and every grid cell. I discretize the specific intensity I into very many different angles and I solve the transfer equation over the entire mesh, including scattering, including sources and sinks to compute what the radiation intensity is everywhere at every angle. And then I simply take numerical quadratures of that specific intensity to compute what the pressure is directly. And I also compute the zeroth moment, the energy density directly. And then I know what the Eddington tensor is everywhere on the mesh directly. And I use that to close the moment equation. So I'm just solving the transfer equation directly. The only assumption I'm making is that the light crossing time is very fast so I can solve the time independent transfer equation. Of course, if you're doing relativistic flows, you can't make that assumption. You're gonna to have to do solve the time dependent transfer equation directly along every ray using similar techniques and that's, another, that's I mentioned that as another way to go. So let me go back and talk a little bit more about each of these methods, uh, sort of their strengths and weaknesses. So flux and diffusion. So we've just made this assumption 
that the flux is just proportional to gradient of E, and then we've got this flux limiter, and it just reduces the MHD equations into what effectively is a diffusion problem, two temperature diffusion. I have a radiation uh, energy density E here, and I have a material energy density small e, that I, and I need to integrate two energy equations, one for the radiation field and one for the fluid field as well. But I don't have the flux because wherever the radiation flux appears in these equations, I just replace it with this form. So I have only, the only independent variable is the radiation energy density. And the beauty of this is it's very easy to solve. I have only an extra equation and it's a diffusion-like equation. Uh, I may need implicit methods to solve it, but it's going to be straightforward. The real con is that I've lost a lot of information. I, and the most important information I've lost is I don't know what the direction of the flux actually is. I've assumed that the flux is parallel to the gradient of E, and that assumption can be violated very easily. There's lots of flows, optically thin flows, where the radiation is going in one direction and the gradient of the energy density is in some other direction. And the classic example of this is shadowing in optically thin media. Flux limited diffusion doesn't allow for shadows to form uh, in optically thin media. Why? Because if you have a dense cloud of gas being illuminated by a radiation field casting a shadow, so let me draw the picture. Dense cloud of gas, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, radiation field coming from the left casting a shadow behind it, well, the shadow would represent a region of very low radiation energy density, whereas the illuminated parts would be very high radiation energy density. So if I take the gradient of the radiation energy density, it's going to be very large and in that direction. So flux and diffusion will think that there should be a very large flux of radiation in that direction, and so it's going to fill in. Over time, it's just simply going to diffuse around until finally the radiation energy density is uniform everywhere. Uh, and there will be no shadow anymore. And so this is a, this is a consequence of having the flux given by the uh, gradient of E. And it's, it's unavoidable. Uh, could be a problem, maybe not a problem. It all depends whether shadowing is really important in, in your flow. Other issues there, they're sort of more subtle and more important for radiation-dominated regimes where, for example, radiation shear viscosity might be important. That's actually not present in these equations. And I say a little bit more about the flux limiter. There's various forms. Levermore and Pomerning is probably the most popular. Also another one by Monerbo. It gives you the right limits. You know, in the optically thin limit, it gives you fluxes that are just C times E, uh, whereas the optically thick limit, it reduces to a third and gives you that F is proportional to gravity as it should. And these methods are able to do radiation hydro in the optically thick regime very, very well. They capture shocks, for example. Here's the so-called subcritical shock. It's a radiation-dominated shock. I'll describe a little bit more in detail later on. The, the, um, when this cap plot was made, there was actually no good uh, semi-analytic solution for these subcritical shocks. So the solid line is not an exact solution. It's an estimate. And the dotted points agree with it quite well. And so the discrepancy isn't too much to be worried about. Maybe what you should be worried about is that these two different limiters, Minerbo versus Levermore and Pomerang, give you different answers. So they converge to different solutions. So, you know, what you assume about the, the flux limiter changes the solution and which, which one are you supposed to use? And in general, there's no answer to that question. And so that's a little bit worrisome. Um, but it works well. Uh, it does require implicit differencing. If I go back to these, uh, this radiation energy equation, you know, there is a very fast time scales associated with this equation, the radiation material interaction terms, and there's a light crossing time in optically thin regions here. So you need to be implicit for solving the non-relativistic problem. So you need to solve the energy equation implicitly, and that's going to give you very large sparse banded matrices. So you're going to use... Um, a newton raphson technique, these equations are nonlinear in the temperature and the energy densities, and therefore you first need to linearize the equations and then use a newton raphson iteration procedure to solve for corrections to the energy density until it finally converges to the nonlinear solution. And that means requiring solving these large sparse banded matrices not just once every time step, but for every newton raphson iteration at every time step. And so you need very efficient ways for inverting large sparse banded matrices. This is a typical form for the equation or the, the bandedness. You have tri-diagonal 
uh, plus three bands off the diagonal. That's because you're in two dimensions coupling nine grid points together at uh, all points, you know, I minus one, I plus one, J plus one, J minus one, as well as in the corners. Those points get coupled as well because of the grad E term. And so you have this, this nine point bed, uh, but it is symmetric. And so things like GM res, ICCG, they work very, very well. So standard sparse matrix solvers work pretty good. And in 3D, the problem just gets worse because your problem becomes, you know, a block diagonal, which block is the entire 2D problem you just solved before with an additional three bands for the K plus one, K minus one, and K values that couple in. So you get uh, 27 points coupling together. 27, no, uh, uh, 15 points coupling together. So. The challenge of doing flux limit diffusion is solving linear algebra problems. You know, so the discretization is straightforward, the implementation is straightforward, the challenge is solving these matrices, either using some you know, package like ICCG, so conjugate gradient methods or GM res methods, so-called Krylov subspace methods, or maybe multigrid or your own rolled uh, matrix solver. That's where all the challenge is. I should say that there are approaches that get around having to solve the implicit problem by making the speed of light smaller than it actually is physically. And this works because, say, if you're looking at the interstellar medium, uh, typical flow velocity or dynamical flow speed might be a kilometer per second or so. But of course, the speed of light is, is five orders of magnitude larger than that. So, and do you really need this enormous range between the dynamical flow speed and the real speed of light? Probably not. You need the speed of light to be much bigger than any other flow speed in the problem, but it doesn't need to be five orders of magnitude bigger. You might get away with making it only 100 times bigger than the interesting flow speeds in the problem. That's a factor of savings of 1,000 potentially, or you could even make it even smaller than 100 times. But the point is you can make the uh, speed of light artificially small, then solve the problem explicitly and not have to worry about in, in, uh, inverting these matrices. Uh, and some careful analysis shows that this works well, although there are, there are some conditions. You can't make it too small. It depends on the optical depth of the problem you're looking at, but you can derive conditions and, uh, and even her student did this back in 2013. And so with these conditions, you can sort of know what the appropriate limits are for using this reduced speed of light. And it doesn't just work with flux and diffusion. In fact, it's not for flux and diffusion. You can use more complex transfer methods and uh, make them explicit by using the so-called reduced speed of light approach. So I just want to mention that, but to understand it, you're going to have to dig into the literature in depth. And as I sort of show before, FLD, the problem is FLD doesn't, actually give you the right answer for problems you're really interested in. So at least for the problem that we were interested in, which is this radiation dominated accretion disk, I already showed you before that this FLD solution is just not consistent with the actual solution. What do we, how do we know the actual solution? Well, we only know it because methods based on direct solution and transfer equation agree with each other. Very different methods agree with each other and they're consistent. And so we think this is the right solution and the FLD solution uh, is not correct, and therefore, for, for some problems, FLD can be great, but again, a warning for some others, it might not be. And so, you may need to check self consistently. You, may, you can always post process your data, use a Monte Carlo method, for example, to compute what the radiation field should be in your application and compare it to what FLD says it is and see if they're consistent. So, you can sort of do post facto consistency checks if you're using flux and diffusion. Let me move on to something more sophisticated, M1, which is a significant improvement uh, over FLD in most circumstances. Um, it avoids these problems, for example, the lack of, of, uh, of shadowing because it keeps the flux as a separate variable. It solves not just the radiation energy equation, but it also in three dimensions solves all three components of the radiation flux equation. And it keeps the radiation pressure tensor by uh, assuming that the Eddington factor is given by this M1 closure that I wrote down before. And it, that essentially is using local information to construct what the Eddington tensor should be and then feed it into the radiation moment equations. Uh, and then you, you just move forward. Once you have written down the equations, you write down the discretization, you're going to get, again, get very large sparse banded matrices that you'll need to uh, invert every time step. I'll talk about that again in a second. And it certainly fixes the problem with the shadowing, for example, because now uh, the direction of the photons, the flux is independent from the energy density, and so you, can, you have enough information to distinguish. 
But it has been realized that it brings in other issues, uh, which may or may not be important in various applications. Again, we're still trying to understand the effects. And one thing that I think everybody agrees on is this so-called photon collision uh, phenomenon with M1. Namely, if you take two point sources in an optically thin medium and you allow the radiation field from these two point sources to expand uh, at some particular time, you get these interacting spheres of radiation. Basically, photons are streaming away from these two sources and creating the source structure. Uh, and at M1, it generates this interaction in between because photons collide and stop and then like a fluid are sort of squirted out the top and bottom. Photons behave more like a fluid than independent particles in the M1. That comes from this underlying assumption that there's a single frame where the radiation field is isotropic. That's, that's okay if you have one source of radiation field. You can always transform to a frame where the radiation from that source is isotropic. But if you have two sources and they're sort of producing photons in opposite directions, you're standing at a point in space and you see photons, you know, a delta function of photons going that way and a delta function of photons going that way, there is no frame you can transform that'll make that radiation field isotropic. So M1 says, let's take the middle frame, make the radiation isotropic in that frame, but that generates photons moving in, in these directions as well and isotropic in that central frame. So photons collide and interact produce this flow in, in M1, and I think this has been known for quite, quite a while, but it's not understood whether it really affects anything. And here's just an image of you know, what will happen with this, these photon collisions here. Here's what happens with flux and diffusion. Uh, it's just more diffuse, as the name might say. The contours aren't nearly as sharp as they might be from, from a formal solution of the transfer equation. So I guess the conclusion is that M1 uh, is certainly more attractive if you have a small number of sources because it keeps a lot more information and it does a lot better job in representing the radiation field. And if you have a lot of sources of radiation uh, and they're in an optically thin medium, if you have a dozen point sources in an optically thin medium, then you may need to be worried or you may need to at least check whether or not M1 is performing well for you. And then finally, I mentioned this variable Eddington tensor approach. Uh, and I've already described a slide of how we do this. So I'm just sort of reminding you again, we have this variable Eddington tensor approach. This is a different way of doing it. Uh, and you could solve the Eddington tensor using short characteristics. This is a technique that I've described uh, on the previous slide. Uh, it goes back to the 1980s. It was developed for doing stellar atmospheres. And it, it basically solves ray segments that cross a single zone. And at cell edges, then you interpolate the ray segments from the neighboring cell. There's no one ray that crosses the entire mesh. You only have segments of rays in each cell, and since they don't line up exactly, you have to interpolate between the ends of the rays in the neighboring cell to get the, the starting intensity along the beginning of the rays for this cell here. So the, the, the beginning for this particular ray here, to solve the transfer equation, I need to know what the, the intensity, the starting intensity is here for the integration, and that intensity comes from an interpolation along this line of the ray segments from the neighboring cell that ended on that line. And so there's interpolation. It makes it diffusive. The radiation field will diffuse in space because of this uh, additional interpolation step. Uh, you could use long characteristics where instead of using these line segments, you go across the entire mesh. You know, every grid point casts rays across the entire domain for all the way to the edge. That gets rid of this diffusion problem, but it's considerably more expensive because not only do I need a ray at every grid point, so that makes it n cubed in 3D. If n is the dimension along one side of the mesh, I need n cubed uh, rays to f cover each point. But in addition, for each ray, it passes across the entire mesh. That's n segments. I'm going to have n pieces of work to do along each ray. So this is an n to the fourth method, where short characteristics is only an n to the th third method, because in short characteristics, the amount of work along each ray is only the one grid cell I'm at. And so that's a very different uh, scaling, and that, this makes, in general, it makes long characteristics just not feasible. It's just not possible to afford it, and so you're going to need something like short characteristics to be able to afford it. It does have real problems with point sources with short characteristics, and again, this is an area of active research. Uh, what do I mean by problems? I mean that if you're far away from a point source, uh, you can get ray effects. You can get the radiation field is not isotropic, it is peaked along the directions of the rays that you've chosen. If you have 100 rays, you get 100 spikes. If you have 1,000 rays, you get 1,000 spikes as you move away. The more rays you have, the more it'll converge to an isotropic solution, but it'll never be perfectly isotropic far away. 
And so if you have a lot of point sources in an absolutely optically thin medium, this could be potentially a problem. That's why Helix is used, because it gets rid of that problem for point sources when you're doing uh, ionization radiation transport. And you, know, you can do lots of uh, tests showing how this transports radiation. Uh, you, know, you can just, the so-called flashlight test, where you just have a beam of radiation on a periodic domain and it just wraps around as a, the beam of radiation. And you notice how it expands a little bit. That's the interpolation causing diffusion of the ray outwards. Uh, you can do shadowing where here's this dense cloud of material, uh, very, very optically thick. It's being illuminated by not just one now, but two beams of radiation. And so it's generating this complex shadow behind it with umbra and penumbra. And so you're getting all the uh, appropriate phenomenology of shadows when you're doing these transfer tests, as you should be, because you're solving the transfer equation directly. So, so this is an attractive way to get the Eddington tensor because it's based on a fundamental solution of the transfer equation. Uh, there's no approximation other than that the uh, light crossing time is very, very short. Uh, and so that solves the closure problem. So that's sort of all I want to say about the closure problem. Let, let me move on as to how, I would then, how you would then embed this into an MHD code, because just solving the transfer equation to get the Eddington tensor or using M1 to get the Eddington tensor is not enough. You still have problems because you have, in the fluid equations, you've got these extra source terms, as we saw before, and these source terms can be very stiff, meaning that the amplitude of these terms can be much larger than the flux divergence terms on the left-hand side. And uh, the stability of these uh, higher order Godinov schemes uh, can be strongly affected when you have very stiff source terms, and when these terms are much larger than the flux divergence terms. And so you need to do something careful. Um, and so uh, it's been, again, this is a common problem in hyperbolic conservation laws. This could be chemical reactions. It could be all sorts of things that people are interested in. So there's a lot of numerical analysis, including stiff source terms. We used an approach by Mignotti and Colella based on so-called semi-implicit integration schemes that modify the time integration of these equations. There's not just using simple second order runge cut, it's doing something more complicated to make these source terms stable. So you do need to do something. Uh, could be so-called IMEX, it could be this Picard iteration, but you need to do something special in your time integration to make sure these stiff source terms uh, are, are being calculated appropriately. Um, you also, if you're doing the non-relativistic problem and you're trying to follow flows at timescales much, much longer than light crossing times, you're also still going to need to be implicit. In the same way you need to be implicit for flux and diffusion, you need to be implicit for, for solving these moment equation methods. So if you want your time step to be much bigger than the CFL condition for the light crossing time on a grid cell, you got to be implicit. And so you solve the radiation moment equations implicitly. The challenge now is that you have four variables, unlike the flux and diffusion where you only had the radiation energy density, now you've got the radiation energy density plus three components of the flux. So you have a four by four system at every grid point to solve and there's spatial coupling terms. So once again, you get a very large sparse banded matrix. In this case, it's not symmetric. And so standard uh, off the shelf uh, linear matrix solvers or linear algebra solvers don't generally work very well. You have to use general form solvers for general sparse matrices. They're usually very inefficient because they've been written in the most general way possible. So we've, we found that it's much better to write your own solver for the steps here. So we implemented multigrid methods. Multigrid are very attractive approaches for doing uh, these sparse matrix solves. So multigrid methods can be quite efficient and uh, they were better than any general matrix solver we could find out of Petsy or Hyper or any other library we could find online. At the end of the day, solving these implicit moment equations is the slowest step in the algorithm because once again, I have to invert these very large sparse matrices uh, and I may need to do it iteratively using newton raskin and so that makes, that's where all the expense is, is in solving these equations implicitly. Okay, so you, you can put it all together. We have all the ingredients. We have moment equations. We've just settled on solving the moment equations. We've got various ways of closing them. Could be M1, could be VET. Uh, we've got this implicit solve to uh, handle the uh, short loss, light crossing times. We have modified time integration schemes like IMEX or Picard integration to handle the stiff source terms. We're ready to put it all together and do some tests and 
I'm a big fan of linear wave convergence tests, so you can write down the dispersion relation for linear waves in a radiation-dominated flow. It's actually a challenge, you know, I say you can write it down, but actually it's quite complicated. There are many modes, many new modes, and there's both uh, damping and uh, propagating modes, and so the dispersion relation gets complicated. Here, here's an example of the dispersion relation for radiation-dominated acoustic modes. Here's the phase velocity and a damping rate for three different ratios of the radiation pressure to gas pressure. Um, small p here is, uh, is a gas pressure dominated case. Capital P here is the radiation pressure dominated case. Uh, and you can see that for, you know, for different parameters, for di this different ratios, you get different damping rates and dispersion rates. The stars here are the numerically measured damping and phase velocity, and they agree extremely well, and they converge. And so you can, so here on the right-hand side is, in fact, a convergence plot measuring the uh, L2 error versus number of grid points per wavelength uh, for two different cases, uh, two different optical depths per wavelength, and two different ratios of the gas to radiation pressure. So you can confirm the fidelity of your method very quantitatively because you can measure L2 errors for known analytic solutions, or at least semi-analytic solutions. You can vary the resolution and parameters of the problem and make sure your method is convergent across the entire application domain you intend to use. So this is what makes these tests so useful, is they're quantitative. They allow you to confirm the accuracy of your method and convergence of your method directly. Um, you can also do nonlinear tests. The downside of linear wave is that they're linear. They're not exercising all the terms in the equations. And so it's important to do nonlinear problems as well, and shocks are a good one. Uh, we saw some shock two problems uh, last time. But shock two problems in radiation hydro is, again, in itself, another research area. Calculating the structure of radiation-dominated shocks is non-trivial. Uh, there's no analog solutions, and you need to solve these problems semi-numerically. In the last uh, five to ten years, there's been several groups that have computed for the first time the uh, structure of radiation-dominated shocks using both the Eddington approximation, that is the Eddington tensors a third, and also relaxing that assumption. I'll show you that result next. And the shock's more complicated because, so we have flow coming in from the left, uh, and generally in hydrodynamics there'd just be a discontinuous jump, and then a uh, constant post-shock state on the right, and we would calculate the jumps by the ranking Huguenot conditions. But that's no longer true with radiation because the problem's non-local. Because I can have photons streaming up, you know, up streaming uh, ahead of the shock and actually heating the fluid before it ever gets to the shock, so you get this this precursor region where the fluid is being heated up. So the curves are showing you the gas temperature T and the radiation temperature theta uh, in a particular flow. So you can get preheating. And then, of course, the energy has to be conserved. Whatever photons are being, compute, are being created and propagating upstream, that has to produce cooling in the post-shock gas. And so the temperature drops in the post-shock gas. So you get this, this smooth uh, precursor you may or may not have a discontinuous jump, depending on the Mach number. And then there's this cooling region behind, a relaxation region, which can be very, very thin. So this, this whole thickness here is just a photon mean free path. Again, this is happening because this is a multi-scale problem now. You see, there's not just a particle mean free path. There's also a photon mean free path. And those two things can be very, very different. The, the particle mean free path is extremely short. It's a fluid. Everything's very, very collisional. So, it's much thinner than this, this discontinuity here. That's the particle mean free path. But the photon mean free path can be enormously bigger than that. And so the shock wave is spread out over this new characteristic scale in the problem, the photon mean free path. And so getting this shock structure was complicated. There's now semi-analytic solutions available in the literature. Semi-analytic meaning that you can write down a set of ODEs for this problem, but you can't solve them analytically. And so you need numerical integration methods to compute these shock structures. So what, what is shown here is a, the blue line is the semi-analytic solution from Lowry and Edwards, and the points are our numerical solution for different Mach numbers, going from very low Mach numbers where the shock doesn't have any discontinuity. The rate of precursor smooths out the shock completely. Higher Mach numbers where there's an actual jump. Higher Mach numbers again. Higher Mach numbers so you finally get this, this cooling region. And if you go to a high enough Mach number, this cooling region gets very, very thin, so-called Zeldovich spike uh, emerges, a very, very high temperature spike, very, very thin region in the post-shock uh, flow. And you can see excellent agreement again. Again, you can measure errors, you can measure 
uh, accuracy quantitatively. And if you relax the Eddington approximation, solve the transfer equation directly to compute the structure of these shocks, this was only done uh, in the last couple of years, you can also study the anisotropy of the radiation field. So now the XX component of the Eddington tensor, no longer a third anymore, you see it, you see it has this interesting structure at the shock front. Again, the uh, red line is the reference solution, points are the numerical solution. Using this Eddington tensor approach, it captures these methods very well. So again, another quantitative comparison. Uh, okay, so, so we're starting to begin to wrap things up a little bit, talking about the challenges. Um, so the real, you know, sort of issue that gives you pause if you want to solve the transfer equation directly is the cost. Because using explicit differencing for the rate of transfer equation is going to cost you uh, nx times ny times nz, the number of grid points in each spatial dimension of the domain, times the number of angles you want to integrate the equations at, times the number of frequencies. So this is obviously at least nm times nn more expensive than than, than the uh, radiation, or than the fluid dynamics is. And if you want to have 100 angles and 100 frequencies, that's 10,000 times more expensive, right? It's impossible. Why are we even talking about this? Well, is it really that expensive? Because first of all, um, the cost to integrate the MHD equations for one grid cell is a lot higher than integrating the transfer equation. The transfer equation is really very, very simple. No complex Riemann solvers needed. The number of floating point operations to, to update the fluxes, if you like, of the transfer equation are at least, at least 10, maybe 100 times less than to integrate, uh, and this is sort of known by, by experience. And so that's a factor of 10 to 100 savings in integrating the transfer equation over this dimensionality. Secondly, you can make fruitful progress by assuming gray opacities, frequency independent problems. That gets rid of that problem. And so then you can do 100 angles for roughly the same cost as the MHD. And that's already very interesting. Now, of course, there are still many problems where frequency dependence is going to be very, very important to include. But I think we can still make progress in understanding radiation dominant flows where scattering, for example, dominates. And if you're in the very, very highest energies, electron scattering might be the most important source of opacity that's, that's modeled well in the gray limit. And so dropping this frequency dependence is, is, is a, a fruitful direction. And moreover, in the future, you know, there's a lot of data, a lot of parallelization possible. So, uh, you, know, don't, you know, don't minimize the importance of progress in hardware. We're going to get, uh, you know, right now we have 10 petaflop machines. Uh, this year, they're installing 200 petaflop machines, a factor of 20 times faster. And the thought is by, and within five years, we're going to have exaflops. So 100 times faster than we have today. That factor of 100 takes care of, of those, that, that scaling here. You know, think big. Think about the future, what's coming. You know, you don't have to be running on the biggest machine. You don't have to be on the exaflop. But we just ride along the coattails. That is to say, the machine you have in your department may not be an exaflop, but it's probably going to be a petaflop because they're going to be so cheap they're going to be one thousandth of an exascale machine, and you could, you know, a department or a university will be able to afford uh, a node or a small machine. And a petaflop machine is already extremely interesting for these problems. And so uh, I honestly don't worry about the cost of it. I think that the most important thing is to get the right answer. Um, and moreover, here's the opportunity. Uh, this is assuming a very, you know, silly discretization, uniform in angle and frequency everywhere. We already know that adaptive mesh refinement works exceptionally well for improving the performance of spatial refinement. Why wouldn't we think it should work well with angle and frequency refinement as well? I mean, in most parts of the flow, I don't need to know the radiation field over hundreds of angles. If I'm in an optically thin part of the flow and I know the radiation field is isotropic, I need six angles and I'm done because I can represent diffusion with only six angles. So why wouldn't we use adaptive mesh refinement to make these? The problem is it's very, very complicated to implement, and no one's done it yet, but uh, that's what you guys are supposed to do. Uh, think of doing adaptive mesh refinement for radiation transfer. It's going to make these problems more than feasible, I think, in the future. Uh, so, uh, yes, we're going to need petascale, but I think you know, we're getting that anyways, whether we like it or not, so let's use it.
Uh oh. Here we go. Oops. Okay, let me just uh, say something about some applications and uh, my technical troubles continues because I moved this to a new computer and, oh, there we go. It is a movie, it runs, so this is, you know, we, we, I said that at the beginning we wanted to study radiation dominated accretion flows around black holes. Well, we've been able to do that using these approaches, not just us, but also several other groups have been able to study radiation dominated accretion flows using full radiation hydro techniques, sometimes in full GR as well. And so what's shown here is a movie of the development of the magnetorotational instability in an in a initially rotationally supported torus of plasma, very much like the uh, problems that Charles was talking about before. This was a poloidal slice, this was an equatorial slice. These bottom two panels are what I think are interesting because they're showing you the emergent radiation field along particular angles. So we happen to have rays along these angles. This is what you would see if you were looking at this disk with a telescope with sort of infinite resolution. Uh, you would be able to resolve, you know, the disk uh, on those two panels. Let me run it again. You know, you see development of turbulence, you see accretion inwards, you see the puffing up of the disk by the radiation field, you see strong outflow again being generated by the radiation field and magnetic fields simultaneously. It's very non-axisymmetric structures, spiral modes, uh, very high M structures in the disk and, and in accretion flow. And then finally, again, you see these emergent radiation fields. You see all these dark blobs, which are filaments, blobs that you saw in the first movies, which are absorbing photons from the hot disk below. Uh, so you're gonna see all kinds of interesting features in spectra and variability, I think, as we begin to process. So the, we're at the stage now where we can begin to compute emergent spectra and variability of these flows for comparison to data. We're not just making you know, images of log density, we're also able to actually compute emergent intensity. Here's a sort of image again of what this radiation field or the, what this disk uh, flow field looks like at late time. These little filaments here and these blobs are what was producing those dark uh, spots on the accretion disk when we viewed it at certain angles. This is the density, this is the radiation energy density. And this flow ends up being very super Eddington with an M dot 20 times larger than the Eddington rate. Uh, how is that possible? Isn't the uh, Eddington rate the most you can accrete at? Uh, it's because two reasons. Number one, some of the radiation is just vected inwards and never is emitted. And number two, the radiation can escape more easily along the poles and through the disk. And so you can have super Eddington accretion when, uh, in these flows quite, quite straightforwardly. And as I said, we can make spectra. And so uh, recent work is taking Monte Carlo. I said it was a great way to post-process the data. It is. So you take a snapshot of that radiation MHD simulation. You post-process it with Monte Carlo to compute a spectrum. You then feed it into the XSpec package to account for instrument response uh, for, say, XMM or New Star, and then you compare it directly to spectra of ultra-luminous X-ray sources, which we think are super Eddington accretion flows. Uh, at least that's understood to be the case at the moment. And so you can compare the observed versus theoretical spectra, so the, the wiggly line, of course, is the observed spectra. The smoother lines are, are not a fit. There are, aren't any free parameters in our models. We just have a radiation spectrum. Uh, we just can fit it, you know, we just put it through these lines. And so, remarkably, these spectra, these emergent spectra, agree extremely well with the high energy tails seen in these accreting X-ray sources. And so, we can begin to make quantitative comparison between these kind of simulations. And already it seems very, very, very promising. I say there's no free parameter, there's only a normalization. So to be clear, we don't know at what level to draw this line. It can slide up and down with freedom because we don't know what the mass of the black hole is in these sources. And we don't know what, what m dot is in these sources. So m times m dot is an unknown value. So we can simply slide this up and down, uh, and you know we've chosen the best fit uh, normalization. And is that reasonable? What m times m dot do we get? It's perfectly reasonable. It ends up being like a 15 solar mass uh, black hole, I think, with an m dot, which is right in the range that we're computing here. So there's a self-consistency in the check that the normalization we need agrees well with the range of parameters for these observed sources. So again, I think this is where some of the frontier is right now.
is computing spectra and variable length. Okay, so any questions? I know this has been a fire hose of stuff. Uh, hopefully you downloaded the slides and so you've been able to go through that. Questions? Yep. Uh, here. I'm sorry, is this problem? Ah, that's an excellent question. So, self-similar in black hole mass, for example? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the beauty of the MHE equations is they're dimensionless, and you can solve, you know, any problem uh, you like if you, f if you properly scale the units of mass, length, and time to whatever values you want. So, you think you should be able to do that here, and the short answer is yes, uh, and the long answer is no. Because what breaks this uh, non-dimensionality problem is the radiation processes. So the opacities can be different. The sources of opacities for an X-ray binary can be very different than the sources of opacity in an AGN. And so you cannot just scale these from one to the other. So for the AGN, the disks are much cooler, and it turns out that it, it seems like iron opacity is extremely important in those sources. The X-ray binaries are very, very hot, millions of degrees. Uh, all the ion is, iron is ionized, and the iron opacity is not important for those problems. And so you need different, two different opacity laws to study AGN versus X-ray binaries. So unfortunately, when you add radiation, it almost always breaks the non-dimensionality problem because you need to account for the uh, appropriate sources of opacities in your problem. Question. The advantages of solving it using, sorry, a... Sorry, of using the variable Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, so the, the, the main advantage um, is reducing the dimensionality of the problem, basically, right? So by solving the transfer equation and computing an NK tensor, then I only need to store the energy density, flux, and pressure. I don't need to store the specific intensity everywhere. If I solve the time-dependent transfer equation, I need to store the specific intensity. It's sort of a data problem. Uh, and, you know, because if I'm going to solve the specific intensity as an initial value problem, I need initial conditions for the specific intensity. I need to store it everywhere for over all angles, and I need to integrate it forward in time. So I need to add another three-dimensional array with dimensions, number of angles, and numbers of frequencies for every grid cell. Um, with the variable energy intention approach, I'm taking moments of it at every grid cell, and therefore I don't need to store it. I can just, I need to compute a temporary variable, which I sum in. So I only need one array, which I just compute a running sum. Every time I do another angle or frequency, I just do a running sum. And so there's a memory savings in doing it. Um, that's really, but, but otherwise, you're right. I mean, it's really not much different. In fact, to be honest, the, uh, this flow here was computed using a rate of transfer equation with a time-dependent transfer solver because we just bite the bullet and solve the rate of transfer equation directly over all angles, and that's really very straightforward. It's not difficult to do. Um, question in the back. On your, on your to the yes. Of one cell? Yeah. Well, it depends where you are. If you're below the photosphere, you're in the very optically thick region, then you're basically thermal. And you take the spectrum from the radiation to Yes. We take, the, we take the temperature and density uh, from the radiation MHD simulation. We then use Monte Carlo to compute the spectrum. And then given the spectrum of the snapshot solution, we then feed it into XSpec and compute the spectrum. So we could have used the emergent radiation field that comes from our calculation directly, except it doesn't have spectral information. It's continuous. It's only one frequency. 
So in order to get the spectral information, we need the Monte Carlo. And you can check to make sure that the total flux in the Monte Carlo simulation is the same as the flux in the Rad Hydro simulation, and it is. So it's also a consistency check that you know, the Monte Carlo solution, when integrated over frequency, agrees extremely well with the, the VET solution, so. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. There is an issue that the actual conductivity in the real ISM is much smaller than the value you need to suppress the thermal instability at the grid scale. And therefore, there is a concern that the structures that you're computing with that value of conductivity is not the same as you would get with the real conductivity. Um, and that's an important concern that you have to address. But that doesn't negate the issue that if you don't include any conduction at all, you are getting this small scale structure which is entirely seeded by truncation error on the grid scale. So, you know, you're between a rock and a hard place. You need to get rid of that small scale structure, but you need to understand the effect of using this larger uh, con conduction. So it all comes down to the size of the problem you can study. You can make your box small enough that your grid resolution is at scales where you can use a more realistic value for the conductivity, for example. So, and you can actually model anything because it's a completely general approach that was, in fact, developed by the, radi the uh, stellar atmosphere community. So, our particular solver includes scattering, um, it includes non LTE uh, source functions. Uh, it's extremely general. Um, I'm sorry? Um, yes, yes. The, the, the issue is that's the Eddington tensor solver. Doing the full dynamics, uh, and if you're only using frequency integrated fluxes and, uh, and uh, energy densities, then you cannot incorporate uh, those issues self consistently or those processes self consistently. So here's another skeleton in the closet. There, you know, I said that we're doing frequency in integrated uh, dynamics, but, and there's, a, there's an assumption that I. S then I zipped past you that I'm, you probably didn't notice, and that is, well, what opacity, are you, what opacity coefficient are you supposed to be using in the momentum equation and the energy equation? Th those terms are integrals over frequency of opacity times flux, so they should be the flux weighted opacity. But you don't know what the flux is, so you, you can't compute that flux weighting. If, if you assume that the flux is thermal, then you can uh, you know, adopt a Rossler mean opacity or something something like that, but that could be very, very wrong if you have, uh, in fact, it'd be wrong by an order of magnitude uh, if your radiation intensity is, you know, some general spectrum. And so there is a very important issue in improving the treatment of the opacities uh, and the frequency dependence. And so, you know, we, we think we're making progress in solving the transfer equation, and yet there's this whole other realm of incorporating frequency dependence and better treatments of past it's yet to be done. Yet another opportunity. Yes? So I know for some of your problems in complex flows like accretion disks, you can use VET with short characteristics and long characteristics together. Could you talk a little more about using the combinations of different approaches when you have a problem like accretion? Um, so that's certainly an, a, you know, a great idea. Um, you know, it's not something that we've tried to do because of the cost of doing the long characteristics. I think where that, the combination I think that is, sounds very attractive is um, heel picks for doing point sources plus VET or something like it for doing diffuse radiation field if you were thinking about doing reionization or H2 regions. Because in fact, uh, for, for evolved H2 regions, the diffuse radiation field is not completely negligible. There's a lot of scattering of the photons and there's re-emission. Every recombination gives you another photon. And so the diffuse radiation field, uh, once the source grows large, can be very important. And so the current, you know, heel picks approach doesn't incorporate the diffuse radiation field. So being able to do both, being able to do point sources and the scattered and re-emitted radiation 
could be you know, important step forward, and that's where maybe a combination of approaches. Something, it's not really long characteristics, but it is a kind of a characteristics-based approach for, for doing the, the point sources. Yes. Scales like in, right. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, I'm not the expert. You should talk to Eve. <laughs> it's a real problem. Um, you know, a lot of the a lot of the reionization codes don't scale once you have more than a few point sources, and so improving that uh, can be can be a real problem. But you know, there are there are ways to do it. Yes. 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 Yeah, exactly. Why not? Um, you know, that's an excellent question. And, and you could. And I, people are. I mean, there are groups. Um, uh, this is not a complete list, but, but Dan Case at Berkeley, for example, and his students comes to mind immediately. They are building, you know, Rad Hydro. Uh, numerical methods based solely on Monte Carlo. The, the issue is, is the noise, as I mentioned before, that if you want to represent the radiation pressure tensor, that is all components of the radiation pressure tensor to better than 1%, which is what you need when you're using you know, higher order finite volume or higher order discontinuous Galerkin, whatever methods you're using, you know, 1% noise is a real problem. You're going to get just a mess of sound waves everywhere from that. It'll completely dominate dynamics. So 1% isn't, isn't really even good enough. But if you want to get the, um, the, those moments to better than 1%, you're going to need an enormous number of packets. And it just doesn't seem feasible to be able to do it. So that's our, that's our worry. And so we've been trying to do. And now, so I think it's important that both of these approaches develop. I mean, we're going to pursue grid-based methods. And I know lots of people think Monte Carlo is great. And let's see where we meet. It may turn out that there are smart ways of doing Monte Carlo that greatly increases its performance, and it makes it the way to go in the future. And that would be great, because it, it really is straightforward to use. Yes? Don't, don't these parts have, uh, have shapes, uh, like the part itself, you They don't. You're just following, their char you know, following characteristics by bouncing these photons around, and you're incorporating energy deposition and so on. Um, but not using shapes. I mean, maybe there's ways to make that better. I can either spend five minutes doing Athena++ plus plus, or I can answer a question. I'm happy to do either one. Uh, I don't know what I should do. If people keep, sorry? I, I don't hear what's going on. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, okay, plus plus, all right. Okay. I don't mean, I mean, I'll be around for questions. We can talk at the break, whatever. So. Have more. So let me just say very, very few, few words here. So there is this new version. It's a total rewrite, so it's basically a brand new code. Uh, it was written because we realized that Athena had lots of limitations moving forward. It didn't allow for non-uniform meshes. Um, adding new coordinates was going to be complicated. We wanted to do GR, and doing rewriting Athena to do GR was going to be incredibly complicated. And since we were starting to write a new code, we thought, let, why not try to improve performance as well? And so um, recently, this code's basically come to fruition. It'll be available publicly, I think, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have definite plans for moving forward. Um, let me just describe a few things that are in this code. One is full AMR, our own AMR uh, implementation. Um, let me just remind you that there's three ways of doing AMR, so-called block patch-based AMR, where if you have some feature you want to resolve, you lay down patches that cover that block in an efficient way. You keep the data on the coarse mesh, and you do fine coarse prolongations restrictions between the overlap, overlapping patches to make all the levels consistent. Or there's something called octree block-based, where if you have some feature you want to resolve, you discretize the, the mesh into uh, blocks, and you only allow refinement within blocks. And you throw away the coarse meshes when you do refinement. So for example, this block here, 
when I refine it into four new lower level blocks, I throw away the coarse block that underlies it, and I only keep the next level mesh. And when I refine this block in this second level, I throw away this corner, and I keep only those four. And then finally, there's a cell based where every individual grid cell can be refined independently of every other grid cell, again, using it typically an octree. And they have their pros and cons. Um, you know, this one is by far the most efficient, but it's also the most complicated. So we've decided to go with this structure here. It's the same as what's used in Paramesh, which underlies the flash code, some others that have it. The beauty of this approach here, and there are many beauties of it, it's fairly straightforward to code, scales extremely well uh, because the communication is only at block boundaries. It gets rid of all sorts of inconsistencies between refined and coarse level solutions, especially when you're doing rate of transfer. That's a real problem in these patch-based. And uh, we've been able to implement CT with this very straightforwardly, so we can do the full staggered mesh CT with this uh, grid structure. So that's all embedded in the code, full uh, AMR MHD in the, in the code. Also, non-uniform and curvilinear meshes. So grid spacing is no longer uniform. It can vary logarithm logarithmically. And the beauty of that is when you're doing things like spherical polar coordinates, then you can de-refine towards the pole. So you can use fewer grid cells at the pole so you don't have this problem with a very, very tiny time step at the pole because your cells are these tiny little wedges right at the pole. And so this static mesh refinement for de-refining at poles and refining the equatorial re uh, regions is proving really, really useful for doing disk simulations. Uh, um, so that's working and uh, will be available in the version that comes out soon. Um, so I've had a student, Chris White, uh, who working in part of this uh, TCAN theory and computation network that's been partially sponsoring this meeting, working with Charles Gammy uh, and his group at Illinois, has implemented full, uh, full GR in the method. Um, and uh, it's, it's somewhat different than, than codes like HARM. For example, it's using different Riemann solvers and it's using the staggered grid version of constrained transport. Both of those are different than what's in HARM. And it, it is true that, and this is not a property of GR, it's been known for, for uh, you know, Newtonian flows, that these more advanced solvers tend to be less diffusive for the intermediate waves. For example, the entropy mode or the slow wave in, in MHD, there's less diffusion. So the dotted line is the more advanced solver. This is the L1 error in linear wave convergence tests for uh, a GR problem using a simple Riemann solver like uh, HLL versus a more advanced solver like HLD, and you can improve the error by substantial fraction for these intermediate modes. For, for of course, as I mentioned before when I described Riemann solvers, for the fast modes, they're exactly the same because the eight simple solvers are using the fast wave speeds to compute the intermediate state. So I think that's an interesting direction for these for these uh, GR methods, and that's this will not be part of the uh, public release, because we still need to keep using this to make sure it's been implemented properly. It will be coming out, you know, within a year probably, but, um, but it will not be in part of the immediate release next month. There's, we worked hard to make the performance of this code improved because, again, this, you know, we all leave a lot of performance on the table when we're using modern processors. They, they really are very, very powerful. And because we're not exploiting the vector units properly or not doing the uh, cache use properly, I think uh, we're not doing, you know, we're not really using the, the, the CPUs up to their performance. So we try to improve that. Um, and we did this because we, you know, there's a mantra in software engineering. First make it right and then make it fast. And I think that's completely backwards when it comes to high performance computing and science. It should be the other way around. It's because when you make a design decision uh, and then you make that, embed that into the code and you make it right, and then you find out later on that that design decision inhibits performance, there's no way you can go back and change it. It's in, in your code now and it's never gonna be changeable. So for example, should you use array of structures or structures of arrays? That's a fundamental design decision you make at the very beginning and once you've made it, you're not gonna go back. And so it's better to actually figure out what is the right data layout, what is the right way to access cache to make these processors fast, and then write the code. And that's what we did. We're able to get, with MHD, you know, over a million zone cycles a second per core, which is not bad because you know, in modern processors, current generation processors have 14 cores. We're up to 15 million zone cycles per second on a single CPU. And I think that's getting very competitive, for example, with GPUs. And so just by using the CPUs directly, we're, you know, it's, no, it's not the same. It's probably only a factor of four or five times 
uh, you know, GPUs can still be four or five times faster, but it's getting attractive where, you, you know, I don't mean to say GPUs are not, you know, attractive and great things. I just mean to say that by careful optimization, you can get a lot, you know, out of performance uh, just by using the CPUs better. Jim, I think yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's been true for a long time. If you're using an Intel processor, you need to use the Intel. I mean, I swear that Intel has a flag in the compiler that says, you know, uh, if GNU, then go slow, because there's all these features that the GNU compiler just doesn't, doesn't do as well as the Intel compiler does. You know, I, I only know G, G++ versus Intel, and, and even different versions of the Intel compiler. So the version 16, can make a big difference compared to earlier versions. Um, so we heard a little bit about this from Hal Finkel, and it's absolutely true that the right compiler is right. Uh, I mean, not talk about details like the parallelization, other than to say that it's a shared memory. It's a mixed mode parallelization. Let me tell you scaling. Uh, so we do two things. We have mixed parallelization, and we use this task-based execution strategy, which is a way to embed uh, MPI communication and work. In the, in, it's a very simple way, a few hundred lines of code. You can write your own task-based execution model for whatever your algorithm is, and it works extremely well. So how well? Well, here's a typical weak scaling plot. This is performance per process versus number of processes. Notice this goes to one million. So we've been able to run this code on an IBM BlueGene Mira at ALCF on a, a million processes. That's 256,000 cores, and we're getting 98.6% efficiency that is to say, we lost 1% efficiency compared to running on a single core on 256,000 cores. So I don't think that these methods don't scale well. I think these finite volume methods scale extremely well. I mean, you know, I don't think this is going to end. I th I'm pretty sure we could go to three or four times this, and we're not going to see the end of this. So these methods, the communication is an absolutely trivial part of the total execution time. It's all in the work of the Riemann solver and everything else. And so... You know, they, they, they just fly. This is why I'm optimistic about using exascale and petascale with finite volume on big, big machines, because we'll be able to use a million processors, no problem, I think. Um, and so there's already papers coming out. This is an old slide already. The very, very first application is now published. It was even a NASA press release, so well, that's got to be a, a, a good thing, I guess. There we go. So here's my summary. So I started with MHD methods, and I would say that they're now mature, and they're Finite volume methods are workhorse methods, not to say they can't be improved and that we shouldn't be investigating new methods, and uh, there's, there's many very attractive methods coming out, but for, for now, they, they are an actual workhorse method. They scale extremely well to a million cores, even with mesh refinement. I, I, I didn't show you this, but uh, yeah, this is with 10 levels of refinement, and we're still getting absolutely perfect scaling. So the AMR scales beautifully, yes. I'm sorry? You're not doing the, uh, dynamic load balancing. There is dynamic load balancing here, yes. You know, so every time you create a mesh, you then, we use Z-ordering and just spread it across the processors. Yep. Um, the, the key is that the communication just isn't very expensive, and you can hide it with task-based execution, so it just doesn't really cause a problem. Um, so, but I, I do think, you know, if, if, I, if I were to give young people advice, I would say look into higher-order methods, because I think they really are going to, and proof, uh, proof things, and there's going to be all sorts of interesting new higher order methods, including higher order finite volume methods when compact stencils and these DG methods we've been hearing about. In addition, another very active area for future work is, is radiation hydro. I'm five minutes over, so I better quit. Thanks very much, and I'm happy to answer questions.